Welcome to Mormon Book Reviews, where an evangelical encounters the restoration. I'm your host, Stephen Pinecker, and if many of you know, on the morning of October 7th, um, all hell broke loose in the Middle East, in, especially in Israel. And this uh, barbaric, nihilistic death cult, um, Hamas, did the unthinkable and the unspeakable, but it's all there, and we know what's happened. Now we're on the verge of uh, the Israelis' response to this uh, brutal attack. And, uh, you know, I was just talking to the panel beforehand, before we get started. You know, I was telling them about Mohammed, Mohammed, who's my friend in Gaza Strip. And, uh, you know, he's in a very difficult situation, but he's a Muslim philosopher and writer, historian, and is not a fan of Hamas. Now, he does have criticisms of Israel and some of our engagements, which I would understand if I was a resident of Gaza, I probably would too. But Muhammad is one of those people of faith who wants to do things in a peaceful way. So I want to ask the audience, just for those of you who are believers, I'd like for you to keep Muhammad in your prayers as well, as well as all the people in the Middle East. So many of you probably recognize many of these gentlemen that have already come on. Of course, we know Jason Olson with the, this book, The Burning Book, a Jewish Mormon memoir, has got a lot of views, many new subscribers to the channel since my interview with Jason. Jason, welcome to the program. Thanks so much, Steve. Really glad to be here. And I want to thank you because you actually then introduced me to Jabra. And we just said, uh, Jabra, welcome back to the program today, sir. Thank you, Steve. Glad to be back. Now, Jabra is a Palest Arab Palestinian Christian who is also now a member of the Church of Jesus Christ of Latter-day Saints. As uh, Jason, of course, was raised Jewish, and at the age of 18, he got baptized into the Church of Jesus Christ of Latter-day Saints as well. And then we got my my really good friend. Um, honestly, I think God put us together for such a time as this. I believe this for, for all of the panelists here. And a uh, really remarkable story about how Nehemiah and I, um, it was just fascinating. He had on Dan Vogel, one of the top foremost Mormon scholars there is, and my neighbor sends me a link to the interview because my neighbor is a Messianic Christian and watches Nehemia. And he showed me, and then within an hour or two of me well, seeing this, I, I was in touch with Nehemia and later he becomes a guest on my program. And then later I become a guest on his program the morning of October 7th live as Nehemia had just been in his bunker for three times already earlier that day. And he was right in the middle of all of it. And we did a real time thing from Jerusalem on his program. And since then, Dr. Nehemia has been uh, doing uh, almost daily updates about what's going on in Israel. Of course, many of you may have seen his interview on the uh, Rude Awakening, where he talks about this miraculous uh, escape from uh, Israel. Uh, Nehemia, Dr. Nehemia Gordon, welcome to the program, sir. Thanks, Stephen. Thanks for having me. And of course, then I've got my good friend, AJ. Now, AJ is a really important person to me because I didn't think what I was doing was what would be called interfaith for a very, very long time. I just was this evangelical fanboy of Mormonism. And then I realized that there was much bigger than that. And one of the people that made it real to me was when A.J. Levy reached out to me and uh, by, because of my parents on Mormon stories. And him and I have become friends. And A.J., uh, you know, you, you are, uh, you know, raised uh, ultra-Orthodox and you're a very good friend of Israel and you're doing a work. One of the reasons I want to have you on the program today was uh, talking about the work that you've done. Of course, I've already had you on as well. So this is many of you probably already recognize AJ. AJ, uh, I want to welcome you, my friend. We've been friends longer than anybody here for over a year. Welcome back to the show, my friend. Well, thank you for having me. It's a pleasure to be on. And it's a pleasure, you know, speaking with everybody here as well, who have seen on your show many times. So it's great to be here. So actually, I just I actually want to get started out with you real quick, AJ, because you are actually doing a lot of work on the, on the ground to help the people of Israel. Maybe talk a little bit about the organization that you're working with, that you're affiliated with, and and then also how people can help your cause. And also, you, from my understanding, you guys do have a Utah connection. Um, maybe talk about that as well. Sure, um, I'll try to dive into it pretty quickly. Um, we, I guess. The morning of October 9th, which was uh, after the Jewish holidays were over, uh, a bunch of my friends reached out to me. You know, we're trying to get friends in Israel that were called up to serve, friends that were, you know, driving out to 
wherever it was to deliver aid to people. And they're like, we need X item or, you know, all different sort of stuff. So uh, myself and many people that I work with um, who care about Israel and really care, you know, were affected by what happened on the 7th, uh, kind of banded together and we started uh, raising funds and um, collecting equipment to send out to uh, people that were called up for reserve duty that were uh, yeah, underarmed, um, well, underdefended, uh, really. So, like body armor and those sort of items, uh, raincoats, um, and as well as for civilian first responders and and people that have been displaced. There's uh, over 140,000 Israelis that have been displaced from their homes currently in Israel. Uh, so, we opened up a charity called the Support of Israel, which we've successfully sent um, a lot of equipment uh, to Israel. There's another initiative, which uh, there's going to be, a, should be on national news tomorrow. It's been on local news in Virginia where, and this ties into the Utah part where we're advocating uh, individual states to step up and help out uh, support um, Israel, the people that are living there. Um, tomorrow, there should be a press conference uh, with the governor of Virginia or the attorney general. I'm not sure, maybe both together where the state of Virginia the Commonwealth of Virginia has donated, I don't want to say the number, I don't want to steal the thunder, but they've collected a significant amount of uh, surplus equipment from the police departments and sheriff departments across the entire state of Virginia, uh, been manifested uh, and put together with the attorney general's office, uh, with uh, local volunteers, and it will be getting shipped out to first civilian first responders across Israel. So as we saw on October 7th, um, you know, these, these uh, places where people live, um, they were the, some of the areas where their first responders were properly equipped, they were actually able to fend off or at least mitigate the attacks on the massacres um, and versus some other places where there, were, there weren't the proper training equipment, so on and so forth. So that's been a priority for me for the past week and a half, two weeks, um, is really the, this initiative. We're looking to go, the Utah part is we're looking to advocate in other states. Um, we have some, through, our, through uh, some of the people that we work with have some connections in the state of Utah. Um, we haven't officially approached them yet, but we are looking for partners uh, potentially to help us uh, lobby the right departments in the state of Utah, possibly to help step up, donate equipment. Uh, that's hopefully sums everything up. Okay, AJ, now just real quick, what's the, the website? The website is called The Support of Israel. Um, I actually have it open. I can share. I'll okay. send you the link. Um, let's see. I do this. Share over here. Share so this screen. is really important because I was telling AJ that there's a lot of people that in Utah, of course, that watch my program. And we want to make uh, this accessible for people in Utah, we also want to know any of my connections in the state of Utah. Uh, maybe we should consider you guys should consider doing something similar that the state of Virginia is doing. So this is the support of Israel.org, and there's a donate button there. And, and there's and there's um you'll get updates, live updates every week of what's been donated, what's going on. Um, and it's for everything medical equipment, food and clothing, protective gear. Uh, you can also note, for example, in your donation um what you want to donate it for so you know people that want to just donate for medical equipment uh for for food for defense related products um you know you state what you know you can kind of state what you want to donate to over there and appreciate everybody's support with that as well so thank you okay great thank you thanks for sharing that aj and of course nehemia you've got some stuff that you uh as well and we're going to get to that in a in a minute but uh before we do that, I know, Jason, you're only available for the first hour. And if this goes over an hour, um, I want to kind of get your thoughts in here. Now, uh, last week, I uh, released our video um, with Jabra. And Jason, of course, you were on the, my very first episode with Nehemia the day after everything happened. Jason, I just want to ask you, as somebody who's really, you know, you're one of the leading um, experts of Zionism in the country, in the world, um, you've done some really good work in this area. Mm -hmm. You were born Jewish. Uh, you still you are Jewish, uh, but you are a convert to the Church of Jesus Christ of Latter-day Saints. And of course, Jabra has a very interesting story as well to tell about that. 
which we'll have him back on for. But Jason, I just want to know on a personal level, how has this affected you, all these events that have happened? Well, thank you, Steve. Uh, personally, it's, um, well, personally, I I see this as not just a war on the Jewish state. I, I see this as a war on the Jewish people. So it's, it's, uh, it's affecting me. It's affecting my family, um, affecting my brother, my sister, my mom, my dad, you know, my dad is a supporter of the Jewish people, but he, he's not Jewish himself, but, uh, my cousins, uh, we have cousins in Israel, you know, um, I, I, I'm my friends that I grew up with reaching out, banding together. We all, uh, we all feel that there's this, uh, genocidal thirst for Jewish blood <clears throat> that, um, the intent to, uh, destroy, exterminate the Jewish people is, is here. It's, it's palpable. It's especially concerning for me on college campuses all across the United States and around the world, uh, but especially the United States. Um, the United States, for, for my family, right, we were, um, our ancestors just a few generations back were immigrants from Ukraine and Poland and Russia and Ashkenazi Jews fleeing pogroms. Um, and now we're, we're feeling the pogroms are in the United States. I mean, there are Cornell University students are Jewish students are not allowed to go to their Jewish life center on campus because of all the credible death threats. Right. The Cooper Union, we've seen the videos where um, pro Hamas, pro terror student organizations are banging on the doors of the Jewish center. Um, myself, my family member, we, we've all been in those spaces and we just feel like. The pogroms are, are coming after us, even out here in the diaspora. Now, the Jewish people have a lot more strength now with with the Jewish state that sees itself as responsible for Jews worldwide. And uh, of course, I'm not I'm not speaking on behalf of the United States or or the Church of Jesus Christ, Latter day Saints in saying this. But that that's, you know, one source of of. Uh, of solace in. Um, and that there is a state apparatus out there that is intends to defend Jewish people all over the world. Um, and so even while Israel is under attack, rocket attacks st are still going. I mean, that's intolerable, right? Um, I served in South Korea for two years. And if you, if you study North Korea and South Korea, you, you just have to dig just a little bit and see what would happen. If North Korea were to divert its rockets from the sea, which is where all their rockets, North Korean rockets go into the sea. And, and what if they diverted them and onto civilian population centers? I mean, just that is intolerable for a modern nation state. Um, and, and a lot of people don't realize that. They just, oh, rockets, big, no, no big deal. There's Iron Dome. But when you, you can't carry out your economy, right, and, and your daily life and your your time with your family when rockets are co you're constantly under rocket sirens and of course the, the incessant terror attacks so so personally um we want uh, you know we want israel to, to to win in the sense of to have a very strong deterrence so that none of this happens again um to the citizens of all types that live there but there's a greater war on the jewish people that is happening globally and it's out of control. And uh, I, we have freedom of speech and all those things. And I think that that's great. But these threats and acts of violence against Jewish people in the United States and around the world are intolerable. Yeah, so that is true that that is happening. And we're seeing the rise of um, ultranationalist movements in Europe that many of them are steeped in anti-Semitic uh, views as well. Uh, we also see... Uh, in in areas where there's large Muslim populations in Europe, um, a lot of anti-Semitic things happening as well. Um, so yeah, this is a worldwide thing. As and of course we're seeing it here in the United States, as you uh, talked about uh, there, Jason. You know, Nehemia, 
I want to bring into this conversation. Yeah. So I want to say uh, welcome back to America. I know it was quite a harrowing story of uh, you getting out of Jerusalem. I just want to say, ask you, how are you doing, sir? You know, I, I um, it it was it was a difficult experience. Um, I never imagined I would be a refugee. Um, like that's something you learn about in history. I never imagined I would actually experience it where I was fleeing for my life and going through situations where I could be kidnapped. And there were, I mean, it was, it was, a. am still getting over it. I mean, it's, it's, uh, <clears throat> something I'm still processing. And while that's happening, I'm seeing the things around me, the mob, uh, coming to attack the plane of what they thought what were Israelis from dog, you know, in Dagestan, in Russia, um, I mean, it, it, you know, so, so, you know, I studied Jewish history. It's what I do. And, um, and I studied about the pogroms and I study about, you know, one, one of the things that sparked the modern, um, really major exodus from Europe before the Holocaust was the Kishinev massacre in 1904. And it's actually triggered a series of, of pogroms. Um, Golda Meir, uh, her father, um, was cowering and hiding while the pe while the, the the people in Kishinev were massacring the Jews right she was like hiding in a attic somewhere with her her family and and that you know shaped her life and and it really shaped a lot of you know the major um uh, emigration from eastern europe to the united states of jews was in in response to the Kishinev massacre and and on the morning of october 7th we were back in Kishinev and but and at the time it happened, we thought, where's the army? Where is this powerful army that we had? How come they're not responding to this? But as more and more information is coming out, we're realizing, wow, this wasn't Kishinev. This could have been Auschwitz. And that was the intention. And uh, the reason it was um, a massacre of 1,400 people, which is horrific. I'm, I still can't believe it. Um, but not 100,000 is because the the Israeli army and other Israeli forces stopped them. Um, there was this woman in near Am, which is a little town on the border there. And she heard, and she was part of um, uh, what they call a readiness squad. Um, meaning it's just 11, well, 10 civilians and this woman who it's her job. She organized this, this squad of 10 civilians who they're supposed to come out with um, M16s. If there's ever a terrorist, a lone terrorist that infiltrates, well, they found an onslaught of 40 terrorists, um, actually more than 40. They killed 40. Uh, people were still killed in near Am, um, but it would have been everyone in near Am if they hadn't responded. Um, so so there are these acts of incredible heroism that were, at least in when I watch the Israeli media I'm hearing about, I don't know if that, those, that information is coming over to America. Um, there were intense battles that took place. Um, there was an attempt to capture Ashkelon that came by air and by sea. That's a city of 127,000 people. And that uh, attack was repelled. Um, I mean, we're talking about, and you're in the Navy, Jason. They were, they were throwing uh, depth charges into because uh, they were coming under the water, these divers, uh, these terrorist divers, to land in Ashkelon and just massacre the population there. So this was horrible. It's the worst thing in my lifetime, um, certainly to the Jewish people. Um, it could have been much worse, uh, is what we're realizing. Um, it's kind of one of those things, I don't know if this ever happened to you, where um, you're driving and you realize you were almost just killed by a truck. And in this case, people were killed, but it could have been much, 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 much worse. And I'm just thankful to the creator of the universe that um, that that you know when the nazis invaded the soviet union they they uh, had these uh what they called the einsatz group and the special units of the ss that gathered up the jews in each area and, and lined them up and shot them um and did other horrific things as well just to entertain themselves and that's what we were invaded by einsatz group and but we had we were able to fight them back and so it wasn't a hundred thousand it was i don't know what the final number will be it won't be 1400 it's going to be higher than that so Nehemia, you know, it's, 
it's one of the things that we actually talk and I'll just bring it up now because you asked the, <clears> for me to bring this subject up. And Jabra and Jason, you know, one of the things that Nehemia brought up to me was the question I had asked about how you like in the United States, we have what's called the Second Amendment, which is the right to keep and bear arms for, for self-defense. And the, I, we didn't really explore that question. But to me, as an American, where I, you know, it's it, guns are very common. Let's just put it this way. It's, people have guns. My neighbors have guns. It's very common, especially in red states. That's the world I live in, right? And so it's almost incomprehensible that if these people along Gaza wouldn't have had, if everybody had a, at least a, one, a weapon, a gun of some kind, it, it could have also helped them defend themselves. Naomi, you had asked me to bring this up. So I, I have a few, and you have a few words you want to say about that. And again, I'm going to hear all the different perspectives on this issue as well, because it's obviously a very sensitive issue here in America. Well, but, you know. but that was always the question people too even said, like the Jews were unarmed in Europe, and that's what ultimately led to the Auschwitz. And now you have the state of Israel that's there, their roles to protect the people. It just seems ironic that those that they wouldn't have empowered the individual's like they do in the United States to defend themselves. Maybe just talk a little bit about that, Nehemia. Well, there's a backstory to the Jews being unarmed in Europe. They, uh, um, by the Weimar Republic had a gun registry law, and so every gun had to be registered. And when Hitler took over, he seized all the guns. He just went through the list and took the guns from the Jews. Um, so when they then came to murder the Jews and arrest them and you know send them to concentration camps, they were powerless. Um, I, I think it, so they should have been armed. Every family on that border um, should have had an AR-15 or an M-16, but the Israeli government, does, it's, not, it's not, you know, you get this impression that every Israeli walks around with a gun. That's not true. Um, there was a readiness squad of 10 people plus this, um, like, you know, 20-something-year-old woman who had gotten out of the army and, and that was her job to make sure the security on the kibbutz was looked after. But they were prepared for, like I said, a lone gunman or two or three guys who might infiltrate, not dozens that were coming with RPGs. Um, so they were um, underarmed. And and yeah, I think, look, I, I came to this conclusion. I grew up in Chicago and I never held a firearm until I was um, in my 20s when I did a short service in the Israeli army. I'd never even held a firearm in my life. And then I saw the Yazidi genocide, and I came to the conclusion that every household owner, as a matter of responsibility to protect those under your care, needs to have something like an AR-15 or, or, if legal, more powerful, right? Um, and it's actually, and look, these things will be investigated after the war. I don't know that it's my, that is appropriate for me to second guess them now. But I can tell you that since the war began, they've handed out 16,000 M16s. Um, I know those M16s. Some of them are from the Vietnam War. Uh, and they say property of the U.S. government. And they were sold for, you know, to Israel uh, basically to dump them because they were worthless to the U.S. And they were refurbished and everything. And a lot has been invested in them. But um, the, every family there should have been allowed to have an M16 or an AR-15 or something. Because when they came to murder them, they... They couldn't, you know, the bad guys have guns. That's one of the things I learned up growing in Chicago. The bad guys always have guns. And um, it's your responsibility as the head of your household to defend defend your family. Hmm. Interesting, uh, interesting thought there. And of course, we also know the vivid images is when the war first broke out in Ukraine. One of the things, first things you saw images of citizens um, having guns. And I think we lost Jabra there, but I'm sure he'll hop back on there as well, and that they were there to defend themselves. So this is not unusual for in wartime situations as well for the population to be armed. And OK, there's Jabra. You're back. We lost you for a second there. Maybe uh, Jabra, said, well, I, you haven't chimed in yet. I'd like to maybe get your perspective because here you're unique. You are a Arab Palestinian, a Palestinian Arab Christian who's a member of the Church of Jesus Christ of Latter-day Saints. And I thought that you brought a lot to the table in our last conversation. Maybe just comment a little bit on what we've talked about so far and uh, maybe give your perspective as somebody who has this, this really unique uh, uh, story to tell. Well, so, yeah, I have a lot of thoughts about everything that Nehemiah said and, and Jason and AJ. Um, I missed the last part of what you were talking about, Nehemiah, but let, let me just talk about it from the bottom and then go up if i may say so so here here are my thoughts about being armed and you know it's 
your gut instinct would say yes if everyone was armed uh, this wouldn't have happened maybe it would have been minimized Nehemiah brought up the story of that redness squad and yes absolutely that works but as citizens especially in the united states or anywhere actually even in syria the way i look at it even if you have all the you know kalashnikovs m16s all the weapons all the bullets you will not be able to fight effectively against a superior force that has rpgs and tanks and airplanes and helicopters and night vision goggles and all of that so you you might be able to kill a bit of the enemy but eventually they will come in and they will rain death on you and we see in syria even for example you know during the arab spring you rebel against a regime like the assad regime which is you know, we've always known it's a barbaric, bloodthirsty system there. The people revolted. The United States is aiding them. The European Union is aiding them. They are giving them weapons and training. But Assad, just because he's acting on his territory with an, a well-equipped army, is able to quash resistance. And in the end, as a population, when you start fighting a war like that, what even if you win, it's like an American lawsuit, whether it's it's your right or wrong. Once the lawsuit is filed, you lose because you have to pay the extreme legal cost. You know, you're, you have to pay lawyers three or, or five hundred dollars an hour to go through a, a lawsuit. And it's the same thing. Once you make a decision as a citizen to hold weapons against, let's say your government turns corrupt or dictatorial or whatever, then you've uh, you lost because in the end your city your town your home your building will be destroyed your neighborhood all of that will be destroyed now this might not apply in the israeli case because you know you're you're surrounded by people who are not friendly i've i've heard aj i've heard nehemiah i've spoken with jason i've read this book and as i said in the earlier interview the the thing that Arabs have never grasped and actually contributed to, and I came to this realization a few years ago, is the depth, width, and breadth of the Jewish angst. We're talking about a population of the world that has a collective trauma that goes back to millennia based because of the pogroms, because I mean, it was interesting to hear Nehemia talk about talk about the pogroms in Russia. That is, that is living almost like living history. It's it's living memory for the Jewish people, and the Arab discourse. And I say Arab, not just Muslim discourse, because that's even a wider wider thing. The Arab discourse is you know is not helpful. Uh, Arabs contribute to this Jewish trauma, and it basically leaves it, it leaves nowhere for trust. It leaves nowhere for trust. And that's why I've come to a conclusion that the only way, the only way to break through that cycle is for someone to decide to model, you know, a different way, a different path, conversation talking to the other side. I've already received some flack for the interview uh, that we've done from dear friends, you know, who were shocked that I would meet with Jason, you know, I'd talk about the way I did. But I stand by what I said. It's, it's the truth. And I think Arabs need to face truth. We need to be realistic with ourselves. I feel that, like you know, when it comes to Hamas, for example, for the last decade and a half, many people have given them a pass because everyone, including me, at the time felt this is legitimate resistance, right? But there was always this fear in me that this streak of violence will eventually turn against the Palestinian people themselves. And... Um, let me give you an example. Something I I wrote about this this week. 
you know, in ancient in ancient Canaan, the Canaanites, the Philistines, the people in Gaza and that area worshipped the god Moloch. And I don't know, Nehemiah, if you know what Moloch was famous for. Moloch I was. Sure do. We, my ancestors also worship Moloch. We learned it from. I, the I know, and I mentioned that. But here is here is what Moloch's specialty was. To to worship Moloch, you had to take your firstborn, and sacrifice that firstborn. And uh, when it wasn't the firstborn, you had to let your children walk on fire for Moloch. And I feel like on the altar of whatever Hamas stands for now, because to be honest, I, I've lost track of what Hamas stands for anymore. They are sacrificing the Palestinian children and not just the firstborn, they are sacrificing every Palestinian child so that they can accomplish whatever purpose they have. Now, another thought I had this week was, Arab leaders in general, and this is a general generalization that I know to be true with every fiber of my being, because I lived through it. Arab leaders treat their countries, their populations as farms and feudal farms at that. And everyone works in that farm and everyone is a slave in that farm. And to please the feudal Lord, you have to do everything in your power, even sacrificing yourself to, you know, please the feudal Lord. And Hamas is, has treated as has been revealed by these recent attacks, because not only the, the horror and the massacres, and to be honest, the genocides and genocide and crimes against human, humanity that they committed in those attacks. On top of that, you know, streak of violence that I was always worried about, it was revealed that they've invested the resources that were given to them in building tunnels, weapons of war, rockets, and all of that stuff. And I failed to see the end game and the end purpose of that because, again, you're fighting against a superior force. Everyone, everyone knows it. I mean, Israelis and Arabs might not feel like this is true right now based on what happened on October 7th, they might feel like we had this victory. But again, I wrote this in a post to my friends and I said, you've tried everything. You've tried regular war, you've tried kidnappings, you've tried storming embassies, you've tried taking hostages, you've tried bombings, you've tried bus bombings. And every time, every single strategy that was followed ended up with more defeat, more bloodshed, and what's being lost is, is the are the lives of the innocent civilians and Palestinian people. And we're losing, as Palestinians, we're losing a generation of children to trauma. I mean, I've I've seen. I try to avoid those scenes as as much as possible, but you know, it gets posted and you see this little child in a hospital in Gaza shaking, eyes bulging, and you see children being carried on stretchers, thanking the ambulance people. And it made me cry. It made me cry. I mean, those children are growing. Are, uh, th th there is no way they are going to recover from this trauma. I, I, I don't think there is. You know, only grace can save them from it somehow. But I don't see how they can recover from it. But like that man, you know, who thinks that by arming himself, he can stand against a tyrannical U.S. government, uh, you can't win. The Israelis have world support. Israel is a state. It's a regular state that, that's recognized. It has alliances. It has the weapons. It has the manpower. And it will defeat any armed struggle every single time. And the only way that we can have a peaceful coexistence with you know, our Jewish neighbors is by follow it, like thinking radically out of the box and you know, honestly practicing radical humility. And I see 
this exercise, many of my friends uh, have written to me and told me, this is unbelievable. You're meeting with Zionists, with Jews, with Israelis, and you're sympathizing with them, and you're, you're, acknowledging, you're acknowledging their history and all of that stuff, which is anathema to 99% of Arabs and Palestinians. But I've decided I want to listen to the other side and listen with humility and remove all of the prejudices that I might have had in the past and just listen with pure intent, with real intent and model that because that's the only way, the only way, no weapon, no weapon can, can you know, can achieve victory for the Palestinian people or, and I wouldn't even say victory, but even the right, the, what they want, which is the right to self-determination, living in their own independent state. And again, as I said in the previous interview, there is even a problem with when we talk about that. And the problem is that the whether the Palestinian Authority or Hamas, they have not been good government. They have not been good, effective leaderships that give the Israelis any ray of hope that they can achieve something or they can be stable neighbors. Because listening to what Nehemiah said, listening to what Jason said, listening to AJ, what the Jewish people crave and want and need is to feel safe and that they are not besieged by people who want to drive them into the sea. And the Arab narrative, unfortunately, whether it's in the public street or governmental, doesn't inspire any confidence. On, on the one hand, you have these governments who use that narrative whenever it suits them to basically divert the populace attention from the fact that they are using them as feudal labor, they are in this farm, and then you have the populace who are really emotional, trapped in the past, trapped in this historical thinking, trapped in their indoctrination, trapped in the lies that we've been taught as children about how this conflict has started and its roots and how it happened. Uh, one of the biggest revelations when I was doing my, my PhD work was studying about the, you know, the Mizrahi communities who lived in Iraq and Egypt and Lebanon and Syria and Libya and Algeria and Tunisia, you, know, you name it, in Yemen. And the story of their, you know, the pogroms, you know, in Iraq, they call it the Farhuds that were committed against those Mizrahi communities who you read the literature, you read people like Ili Amir and the man, you know, b before, before 1948, before the Farhud, he thought of himself as nothing but uh, an Iraqi who has, who is a Jew by religion. But to him, Iraq was his country. He was a Jew religiously, but he was as indigenous as any Arab in Iraq. And you learn about that, and then you you realize, oh, okay, this is this is a very important piece of information. It's uh, so you know you know the biggest hurdle to peace negotiations have always been the Palestinian refugees, right, in all of these Arab countries. And then you listen, you you hear about the million Jews who who've been uprooted from Arab countries and driven to Israel or some other places in the world, and you say, well, on moral grounds, we can't ask for Palestinian refugees to be returned to, to Israel or you know, to take back their place. Because first, those people have died. And second, the ch their children and their children's children are the responsibility of you know, the Lebanese, the Jordanian, the Saudi, the Emirati, the Egyptian governments that absorbed them, you know, because that's that's what's normal. That's what you do. The fact that they've kept them in refugee status for so long and they treat them, they treat them like nothing. I mean, I've luckily we had Jordanian citizenship when we lived in Kuwait, right? 
So I didn't experience even 1% of all the inconveniences and the hassles that the people with the Palestinian travel document experienced. But those people were my friends, my neighbors, and I've, I've seen what happened to them. They could be kicked out of Kuwait, their business businesses taken from them on a moment's notice. And that is like a moral failure on the part of the Arab leaderships. Why isn't this, I was born in Kuwait, yet I was never eligible for Kuwaiti citizenship because the Kuwaitis wouldn't do that. And the question is, if you love the Palestinians so much and if you care about them, why wouldn't you give them citizenship and end the refugee status? At least they can travel, at least they can have a normal life, at least they can have equal rights with work, et cetera, et cetera. But they would not do that because the suffering of the Palestinian refugee populations in their midst suits them. They can use them as cheap labor. They can kick them out whenever they want. And, you know, it's easy for them to look like the, the heroes and the big nationalist leaders when they, you know, want to pump themselves up and talk about Israel, you know, because as Nehemiah knows and as AJ knows and Jason maybe a little bit, Arab leaders love to do that. You want you you want to pump yourself up. You start speaking against Israel, and you you're you're the hot shot, and people are diverted from you. You know, King Abdullah of Jordan is doing that right now. His wife gave an interview on CNN, and you know, not one word of sympathy to the Jewish survivors and the Israeli victims, and instead narcissistically focused on the, the people of Gaza, who we should sympathize with, but. Again, as I keep telling my Palestinian friends, nobody is going to listen to one word you say unless you acknowledge what happened on October 7th. Jason, unless you wanted to, Jason, you wanted to say something. Why don't you chime in? Yeah. yeah. <clears throat> Thank you so much, Jabra. I I just wanted to interject, right? So, and I, I just had this discussion with a Latter-day Saint scholar friend. Um, right. So Israel is a Jewish and democratic state, right? Every everything surrounds these two principles, and a, a lot of times the and and I, I appreciate so much what Jabra is saying because a lot of times folks want to make this about race or they want to make it only about ethnicity. They want to make it a you know um, they want to compare it to the situation of uh, black people, African Americans in the United States. The issue is is Israel. Uh, absorbs uh, all kinds of Jewish immigrants. If you go to Israel, and, and that's why what, what Jabra is saying, what he, he studied about Mizrahi history is so crucial. But it goes even further than that. Israel has, has black Jews, brown Jews, white Jews. Mm -hmm. I mean, all kinds of Jews from Africa that they're, that they're I mean, racially, they're black. But Israel is taking in, it, it is a Jewish state. It, it is Jewish and democratic, but in the Jewish category, it is a religious state and it is bringing in uh, immigrants that practice Judaism, that their I religious identities are Jewish. And Israel's bringing them in from all over the world, from every imaginable uh, racial or ethnic demographic, including Africa, India, China, it doesn't matter if that's your religion. Israel is willing to bring you in. And so there there is this idea that there's only one Jewish state, you know, even Netanyahu, that I, I actually agree with how he phrased that the one and only Jewish state. It's very tiny. It's very small. It's very beleaguered, but it's one place. And I think members of the Church of Jesus Christ of Latter-day Saints have to sympathize with this because the early history of the church was all about religious immigration. There was the perpetual emigration fund, PEF. Now it's education. But in those early days, right, Joseph Smith, Brigham Young, they were bringing in Latter-day Saints, Mormons, uh, of all any racial background in those days. It's just they were adhered to this particular religion. And the church would help them immigrate to um, Missouri or Nauvoo, Illinois, or Utah. And there was a, a way to, to absorb these immigrants and then 
find a way to protect them. That required a lot of negotiation with the, the federal government and state governments. And in cases of in the case of Missouri, it failed. Also, it failed in Nauvoo. But if, if anybody can sympathize, this is not about colonialism. It's not about imperialism. It is actually about Judaism and it, about bringing in all kinds of Jews to to one land that Judaism considers sacred. So I, I have to I'm forced to reframe this. Um, and and not only that, Judaism is indigenous to to the land of Israel. Um, so is Islam and Christianity. That's why I mean, that's why these things are very com complicated. But I really view Hamas's intentions. It's small, but Hamas has great powers backing it. I mean, we, we have Iran plus Hezbollah, but the Houthis plus Syria and Hamas and and so many other sympathizers, even the Taliban. Right. So Hamas is, is a beachhead uh, for um, an Islamist empire and, a, against an indigenous population that includes Jews and Arabs. Um, so it's just I'm reframing it. It, it might sound, uh, you know, to totally different than the, than the standard that people are hearing. But we have to understand uh, it, it. And part of this conflict is that democratic part. Right. It's a Jewish and democratic state. Israel's trying with tooth and nail to remain democratic. And that's also why, what with Jabra's hinting at, Israel cannot absorb Palestinian refugees because if Israel absorbs the Palestinian refugees and then it has a Palestinian majority, then there is no more Jewish state. So it's it's this battle and this balance of trying to maintain a Jewish and democratic state. Well, but at the end of the day, yeah, yeah. So. Yeah, I'm sorry, Jason. So here yeah. is here is my my main thesis, and this is this is something I believe in deeply. Nations survive and fall by one idea, which the founding fathers of the United States enshrined, and I think it's the most important idea, which is equality before the law. Okay, equality. I I'm not I'm not someone who thinks of democracy as you know you go you elect because we know people don't care about elections but people care about being equal before the law and having the freedom you know to worship according to their conscience believe according to their conscience and this is enshrined in the united states and the failure i think in in all arab countries all Arab countries, no exceptions, have been failures in reaching this conclusion that there is equality, that they need to give their people equality uh, before the law and freedom of conscience. And this is this is this is a part of the reason, this is a part of the reason why why we struggle. And I think the best way, the best way to end this whole conflict is to enshrine to enshrine that idea. Now, one of my biggest, so when I was at BYU, I wrote this paper many years ago when, when Rabin and Arafat shook hands. I ex wrote this paper and I expressed great enthusiasm and you know hope and I was very excited about it. And I think every Palestinian was excited about it. But I think the main failure the main failure of that, those agreements was that Arafat was not told that by either Rabin or by Clinton or whoever that that is the idea. That's what we need Palestinian society to look like. This is the first step towards establishing trust with, with Israel, right? And I think one of the biggest failures on the Israeli side has been not that it's Israel's responsibility, but I think there has been this uh, short-term thinking that we need we need someone here, we need Arafat, we need someone to take control of the West Bank in Gaza, and you know, Arafat was corrupt, the whole PLO was corrupt. 
And them being in there without being told that explicitly was a problem from the start. Uh, if that expectation was set, you know, things might have ended up different. Now, with Israel, what is really interesting, just going back to what you were talking about, I think the reason Israel has been really successful at in, with integrating all of these Jewish people from all over the world is because there is that idea enshrined in Israeli law. Now, I know it has many shortcomings and Palestinian activists would bring up all kinds of opinions about it. But on the whole, when you look at it, Israel has this system where you know everyone is equal before the law and you have this freedom of conscience to worship, say, act, do however you want, right? So on one hand, you have, you know, I have my very good friends in Kfar Chabad, you know, I study Torah with them and they are very, you know, they are ultra Orthodox. They love the Torah. They, you know, very conservative. But then in Tel Aviv, just, you know, a few miles away from them, you have uh, the pride parades every year. Right. And this is wonderful. Now, imagine you, you can't have that in any Arab country surrounding Israel because most of those people in the parade would be killed. And I think that's that's what Israel has to bring to the table. Now, everyone now is talking about what's going to happen in Gaza after this whole operation is done. I think the the best way to achieve peace is by starting a dialogue around these ideas that Arab societies, Palestinian society needs to have this idea. And I don't know how to do it. We need, we need people like the founding fathers of the United States, people with that kind of vision to do it. Nobody else can do it for the Palestinians but themselves. But th the seed of this idea has to be planted, that this is the way forward. And we need to stop talking in terms that, you know, raise this existential angst with our Jewish Israeli neighbors. We need to stop talking about the past. We need to stop talking. We need to be informed by the past, but we need to have, like uh, I said before, a veil of ignorance over it and start from a new original position, which is based on, we need to focus on the future. We need to focus on the children. We need to have peace. We need to have a society that's free, that has freedom of conscience and equality before the law. Israel already has that. The challenge is in, in the Arab mind because I'm afraid cultural, cultural, religious, or for other reasons, we Arabs can't think of these in these terms yet. Uh, well, I watch, and, and you know, Jabra, I want to I want to um, interject here too that yeah. one of the great tragedies of the uh, Western um, uh, education system. Is that the great the 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 ability we have the capabilities of educating Palestinians Western values democratic values and everything like that? Unfortunately, many of our universities have been corrupted by these very same horrible ideas that have infected the the Middle East. Have also infected many of the campuses in in our country. So this great opportunity to help Westernize the Palestinians, they they would literally be taught the same things that they're being taught by Hamas in some yeah. of these classrooms. Yeah. Here is, here is my take on on academics in the United States, you know, if, and, and this is this is not a cliche, this is a fact. Most academics live in ivory towers, are very detached from reality on the ground, and my wife and I, you know, she's going through her PhD, I did mine, and we talk about how hard academic papers are, you know, the, it's like they live on another planet, right? But I think they they have something to bring to the table. And I think universities need to be places where people can freely talk, but without prejudice. But people need to be freely talk in a civilized manner about issues and do this radical sharing, facing, you know, of ideas. At least you know what everyone is thinking and that's where you start. What's happening in academics right now, unfortunately, driven by the scenes that we're seeing on the street, angry students and all of that, there is a push to 
limit academic freedom, limit academic freedom on campuses. And what that does when we limit academic freedom, you know, I mean, and I'll say it openly here, for the last, I'd say, 10 years, there has been this push on uh, American campuses. I mean, it's driven by a lot of Jewish organizations, American Jewish organizations, to censor Palestinian professors or any professors who express opinions that are pro-Palestinian. And many people have lost their jobs. Contracts have been rescinded. Just last night, a friend of mine who's an academic, I, she told me that, uh, that she was told to stop and not say anything. And that is not productive because we need a safe space to express our opinions respectfully without calls to violence, without supporting violence, with empathy. And, you know, like, for example, for Palestinian professors, their allies on American campuses right now, the idea that need, they need to understand is you cannot talk about any of this without expressing explicit sympathy towards what's hap happened to the Israelis on October 7th. That was a horrendous genocidal barbaric act that does not belong in the second decade of the 21st century. That's the starting point. Now, you want to argue about apartheid, BDS, you know, all of that stuff, fine. Let's put that on the table and talk about it. But also when you talk about that, you need to listen to the Israeli allies and Israeli professors and Jewish professors and have them talk to you about their angst, why this dialogue, what angst this dialogue brings in them. When you say things like Palestine from the river to the sea, you're basically saying, I want to throw the Jewish people into the sea. I'm sorry, it's never going to happen. First, that's incitement to violence. That's genocide. That's ethnic cleansing. And you can't say these things. That shouldn't be a part of your vocabulary. And but you, you need to listen to the Jewish side, you know, and why this is bad, why this brings up the pogroms, the Holocaust, and all of that stuff. You can't publish, and I sent this to Jason earlier, uh, uh, well, last week, I sent it to you over the weekend. I'm in this pro Palestinian Arab group. I've watched them for years. I never said a word, and I will never say a word. I just watch. And they post this stupid tweet. And in it, they are saying, oh, it wasn't 1,400 people. It was more like 100. Haaretz revealed the numbers. And they quote Haaretz. And, and I'm like, first of all, I've read Haaretz. I have a subscription. I've read it for years. I, I know for sure this hasn't happened. But they are spreading this fake information. And people are lapping it up. And this group I'm on, it's smart Palestinian academics. And uh, um, so we need we need to have open spaces where we can talk and express our feelings. We need to talk about way, why this conflict is happening, but we also need to be careful with our speech so that we don't appear to be sympathizing with acts of violence and acts of genocide or supporting further acts of genocide and violence. And to be honest, we have to totally, under, there is no way for Arabs to go forward with this without understanding the Jewish history, the Jewish point of view, the Israeli point of view, to, without talking to people like Nehemiah and, uh, Nehemiah and AJ, w there is no way forward other than that. Yeah. And, and of course, Jabra, you got plaque for having these very conversations yes, from some and, of your and, peers. And so, yeah. but, and you know, Jabra, real quick, Jason is going to have to hop off here in a minute oh, or two. Yeah. Oh, yeah. Sorry, Jason. And I want to get, I want to get Nehemia and AJ into this conversation as well. Be, uh, Jason, you only got like a minute or two here. Was there just any final words you wanted to say before you leave the panel discussion? No, I'm, I'm just so grateful that, uh, that Jabra can just acknowledge the humanity of the Jewish people. And I think that right now, all the Jewish people, almost all the Jewish people in the whole world are are hardening um, because they're being hardened against. But the, the way through this is we, as the Jewish people, we also need to see 
the humanity of the Palestinian people. And, and that's the, the beautiful thing, even that Jabra's tapped into, I think, of the Jewish tradition, uh, you know, and why I go back to Abraham Joshua Heschel and every human being is an image of God, you know, and um, it, I mean, we have to hold on to that because that that is the conscience, the humanity Right. This that conscience and humanity is why Jews are targeted all over the world. Um, you know, as I've said before, Hitler wanted to destroy the Jewish people because he saw them as the source of of conscience and humanity, that they uh, looked at the world um, in this way, in this beautiful way. That I think that every single human being is an image of God as comes from a common father and mother in adam and eve i mean that story was either in, revealed to or invented by the jews and and so we i think as a jewish people we have to to hold on to those those teachings amen well jason i want to thank you so much for coming on the gun when the burning book uh is your book that you wrote along with james goldberg i definitely recommend it it's a beautiful story and uh you're a beautiful person jason thank you for being my friend and thank you for hopping on today Thank you. God bless you all. Love to you all. We'll, we'll so, talk again. Bye, Jason. We're going to continue here for a little bit longer. Um, and uh, I want to bring in uh, both AJ and Nehemia here. Jabra, you yes, talk I'm a lot. You. You, you say a lot of good things, but we also need to hear from our, our yes, brothers absolutely. here. I, I want to hear from Nehemia and AJ, so go you know, ahead. I think Jabra's voice is extremely important because yes. um, I, I'm hearing... Uh, people on the Arab side who are expressing similar things, but not that many. Um, I can probably, and, and, may, and I'm just talking about like an English or Hebrew, um, so maybe there's more in Arabic. I kind of doubt it. Um, uh, there's not that many. You know, there's Yosef Haddad, who is a, was an uh, Israeli Arab, and, you know, the, there are people who are expressing um, uh, what I think is sanity, which is that, um, I mean, look, you talked about apartheid. Israel has two official languages, mm -hmm. uh, Hebrew and Arabic. Um, mm -hmm. Palestinians, let's say Arabs, have more rights in Israel than they do in Lebanon. I know. So Lebanon is the apartheid state. In Lebanon, <laughs> someone whose grandfather fled the war of 1948, and his and he was his he was born in Lebanon, and his father was born in Lebanon. His grandfather fled is by law a second class citizen who can't engage in certain um professions professions I, I mean it's 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 unbelievable that the same uh people of the same descent living a few miles across the border in israel um many of them you know i, I heard one uh testimony of this um uh israeli arab from the galilee uh i think it was from um al fahim and uh he said that um his family was leaving in 1948 and the Jews went after them and said, stay, we want to build a country together. And his family and everyone in his area, at least, that clan, they serve in the Israeli army and they feel part of the country. And they feel their people were attacked on October 7th as well. And mm -hmm. some of them were killed. Um, there was a, a, a member of uh, United Hatzalah, which is a volunteer organization that helps yeah. um uh, it's like an ambulance organization. Yeah, they're, the motor, they're the ones you call and they come in, they're volunteers. Right. So yeah. oh, he froze. Um, but there, so there was a man named Awad, I forget his last name, uh, an Arab, and he was not only murdered by Hamas, who knew he was an Arab, who knew he was a Muslim, yeah. um, because he told them, but then they butchered him and and disfigured him to where he was unrecognizable. Um yeah. So, I mean, their intention was de or desire was definitely to kill Jews, but they'll kill um, Arabs if they get in the way. And so an Arab in, in Israel actually has more rights than an Arab in, in Gaza or an Arab living under P the PLO, Fatah's um, control yeah. in the West Bank, and certainly more than in Lebanon. I mean, yeah, so this, yeah. is, this is kind of this paradox. Jews are accused of having an apartheid state. Um, well, because you, and one of the arguments I've heard is, well, you allow you allow Jews to immigrate there, so it's an ethno state. You mean like China? China, if if your ancestor came to build the railroads in the 1800s in the U.S., you can and you and you're of Chinese of Han descent in particular, you can immigrate to China, uh, and some do. I know people who have. Um, so you know that that's 
policy that some countries have. And but um, you know, what, what makes a democracy, and I'm a big believer in democracy, what makes a democracy is the protection of minorities. And Israel is proud of that. You know, if you have four wolves and a sheep who vote on what's for dinner, that's not democracy. Mm -hmm. Um Israel uh, gives rights to um, the Muslim uh, minorities, and, and there are some problems with with uh, Latter Day Saints. I'll admit that um, as as a relatively new movement. But the traditional populations uh, who were, were in Israel, um, if you're a Muslim cleric in the Galilee, you get your salary from the state of Israel. Mm -hmm. If you're a Christian cleric in the Galilee, you get your salary from the state of Israel that comes out of taxes, right? So. Um, I don't know. Show me that in um, in in a uh, certain. I mean, you're not even allowed to be a Jew and live in in Jordan. Um, certainly not in Gaza or, or uh, Palestinian territories. Mm -hmm. You know, AJ, uh, I want to thank you so much for coming on. I know you got just at the beginning. I just want to get some. You know, there's a lot to unpack here. We've covered a lot over the last hour, and I really want to hear uh, your perspective on this. Uh, I just kind of just talk about whatever you want to talk about what we talked about over the last hour. Sure. Um, a lot of great stuff, uh, Jabra. Love uh, what you brought up and what Jason has brought up and Dr. Nehemi has brought up. Um, a few different, you know, kind of subject matters that were touched upon. Um, the reason why, you know, with the whole gun control in Israel, that topic, just briefly. Oh, here we go. Um, the, 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 the point, really, I mean, they do have... The state of Israel, why they have their laws, uh, they're very careful because they know it's a very much a hot situation there. Um, so, you know, what they try to do is really minimize civilian deaths in, in the sense of that the people who get the guns and what guns they carry, it's every single bullet that every Israeli person gets is, is noted. Um, and really kind of the point there is that the military is supposed to step in and there isn't ever supposed to be a failure like there was a failure on October 7th. And heads will roll after this is all over politically and in the military sector um, as, they should, as they should have. So kind of, I mean, it, 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 and, and we do see, I, I, you know, not to touch upon, but there are certain more radical um, um, fringe elements in kind of settlement areas that have gone on and, you know, done personal vengeance, which again is not really. And, and those people by... are hunted down by the Israeli authorities and prosecuted as yes. they should be. Yes. And, and, and yes, exactly. So uh, it, it's very clear that any sort of resistance of, uh, you know, of both sides, you know, people that, that move out to these uh, predominantly Arab areas, <laughs> Um, and are instigating violence uh, are kind of acting in a similar sense of where they're not really respecting the law, democracy, their neighbors. Um, and that's not going to solve anything because that's just going to inflame people to behave the way, you know, in response uh, with violence. You know, violence begets violence. Um, you know, so it, it, it's, it's, you know, and everything, and as, as, and as Jabro said, you know, if you, you have to first, um, acknowledge that that there is violence happening and that there's casualties uh, to civilians people that are truly innocent civilians um uh, people you know they're they're if we want to talk about the music festival which is something which over the days more and more people who i'm adjacent friends with that were slaughtered there that were uh, the kindest most peaceful people and from all over the world um that were that were slaughtered you know, just because, and beyond just being slaughtered, as Dr. Mohammed said, like the, that were afterwards, their, their bodies were defiled. Um, their, their, their corpses were defiled. And, and there's no form of resistance that's going to gain any sympathy uh, on, on any sort of level. Um, if that's, if, if that's kind of how, you know, there's how the resistance happens. Um, and, and that's something which, Unfortunately, you know, October 7th, October 8th, October 9th, you know, people are like, okay, we kind of get that. Um, hopefully the world kind of gets that. Like that's not, that, that's, that's not the way to go. And then what happens, you know, kind of automatically over, uh, over the couple, next couple of days is that there's a response, there's collateral damage. Um, and there, and uh, it's a whole nother podcast if you want to get into kind of, 
you know, Israel's response and kind of the failure of the state there. But people then, you know, came, I, I have friends that, you know, were quiet for a week. Uh, and then after, you know, the IAF was, responding the way they are kind of preparing for you know some sort of ground invasion um you know minimizing casualties for soldiers so on and so forth um and and there are plenty of plenty of issues there as well but people then totally disregard oh wait a second women and children and 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 older people were butchered uh, they they just two days ago they buried somebody's head they only had the head of a child they couldn't find the body there's hundreds of bodies that haven't been identified because families have been massacred, uh, complete families have been massacred, bodies have been burnt, people were burnt alive to, to the point where they can't, pu they can't pull you know, DNA samples. Um, and there's no form of resistance that's gonna gain sympathy. So if you wanna be productive, um, and I think on the, from the Israeli perspective, and there's a lot of differing voices that are coming out, if we wanna be productive and kind of at least tempering the violence and, and moving towards a solution that might be, you know, uh, mutually, that will be mutually beneficial for the majority of the population. You know, no one, you'll never have everybody happy in a situation like this. Uh, we have to, you know, talk to people from the other side. We have to um, go out of our way to, to uh, really have dialogue um, with people that have, that are suffering on both sides and acknowledge the suffering on both sides. That's kind of something which is, uh, been very important for me is, is to think about kind of those sort of things and it's and and just the comment you know it was brought up I guess about the universities is the problem that I found is it's beyond really the kind of the educational infrastructure where there's a lot of silencing of opposing voices depending on who holds the keys or has the most support on campus but the siloing of information and the barrage of of whatever you're into of, of anxiety that social media empires are built on, where it, you're, you're fed, you're not fed anything that would do anything productive, at least for me and I, my wife and friends, where it's like, you're just fed more and more stuff that will drive, you know, more and more of your anxiety or your anger from whatever yeah. side. And you, you won't get any, any, nothing in your feed and, and, and nothing uh, unless you go out of your way when we have these sort of conversations. Yeah. Um, nothing will come into your, onto your um, social media information or engagement that doesn't drive a certain addiction of anxiety, which, which gets you into this kind of tunnel vision. And it's, it's, for me, I find it like sickening and wild to kind of see that this is just happening for advertising dollars, that people can't sleep at night because they're being exposed to violent videos um, and, 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 and people are getting riled up to do things which they would never do. Um, I don't think of people that have acted in ways they have on, on the streets in Europe and in America and so on and so forth necessarily thought about these things a month ago that, oh, I'm going to go and attack Jewish students. I'm going to go and attack Palestinian students violently um, without being kind of driven there by algorithms that are built to built to profit um, and, and drive you in that place. And, and it's something which is uh, very concerning. Uh, and, and any sort of path forward, you know, kind of there has to be this dialogue and understanding of each other's, of, of each other's voices and not just the, uh, I would say, not just the spokespeople that are kind of you know, feeding for their engagement, kind of a gotcha clips, you know, having the real difficult conversation, uh, talking about people's day to day lives um, in, in all of these areas. You know, there's I, I lived in Jerusalem for five years, um, right near where East Jerusalem and West Jerusalem, the kind of the border. And I worked in an area that uh, I would call them kind of uh, anarchist Jews that have rejected the state of Israel. They were there, the original settlers in Jerusalem. Um, from in the of the restoration of of Israel, so the, uh, the 17th uh, 18th century, I believe they moved out there, and they lived peacefully with their Arab neighbors. I I worked in a kitchen um, with Arab workers, and you're talking about Jews and Arabs with you know 
10 inch chef knives working right next to each other. Um, and, and people just kind of, Oh, how's your day? How's your kids? A uh, kind of, you know, that is going on as well. So and there needs to be more of that, of, of people just recognizing the humanity. Everybody just wants to have a meal. Everybody wants to spend time with their family, with their elders um, on all sides. And, and that's just something which I, you know, kind of feel very passionately about, I guess. Nehemia? So, yeah, I have, I have a question for AJ because he's talking about being productive, that, that the Hamas resistance wasn't productive. And this is a question for Jabra as well. Do either of you think for a minute that it was um, Hamas's objective to be productive? I, I, I think their objective was to draw Israel into Gaza to kill as many, so that Israel would kill as many civilian uh, civilians, uh, um, Arab civilians as possible. And then they would demonize Israel and turn Saudi Arabia, who was looking into a, a peace deal with Israel, against against Israel. I think that was the objective. It's very similar to what Al Qaeda did on 9/11. The objective was to draw the United States into um, Afghanistan, and I don't know that it was a mistake to go into Afghanistan. Um, mm -hmm. You had to defeat uh, Al Qaeda and root them out. Well, you know that's what Israel needs to do. Here, here's a quote from uh, RT News asked uh, a Hamas official named Musa Abu Marzouk. They said, look, you've got like 500 miles of tunnel, 500 kilometers of tunnels underneath Gaza. Why don't you bring the civilians in there to protect them? And mm -hmm. his response was the tunnels in Gaza were built to protect Hamas fighters, not civilians. Protecting Gazan civilians is the responsibility of the UN and uh, and he said the occupation, meaning Israel. Will you send me this quote? I haven't seen sure. it, but please send it to me. But I I concur with everything that you've said. So it goes back to my original point about Hamas reverting to that whole Arab leader. I wouldn't even say, you know, desecrate the word leader by associating it with any Arab, you know, man in power. But here is, here is what they revert to exactly, that the population is there to serve their ends, to serve their ends. Hamas gets aid, power, money, weapons, whatever, because of the suffering of the people that it governs. It's not invested. They have never been invested. It's like the Palestinian Authority. It's a money-making endeavor. And they do not serve their populations. It's the same with the, with the government of Egypt. It's the same with the government of Iraq. It's all of these Arab governments. This is the logic they think in. And Hamas could see the writing on the wall. I watched an excellent uh, YouTube with Farid Zakaria from CNN. He's one of those people in, in that channel that I really respect, and he's always had like a balanced opinion about things. But th that's what he said. He said they could see the writing on the wall. They could see Saudi uh, having a, a peace treaty with, with Israel finally. They could see their support uh, withdrawing in the region. Nobody has been talking about them. And they did this attack in a spectacular way with as much, I mean, my words for it is they released the psychopaths on those people in the Gaza envelope. They released the psychopaths knowing exactly what's going to happen, knowing the extent of the damage and putting the Israeli government in a position where it has to respond. And they knew exactly. I mean, the minute I heard about what happened, I knew exactly. I could. It was like I could see the future. I knew exactly what was going to happen. It's so predictable. And what I said in the previous interview, I'm a chess player, okay? And when I play chess, I like to do, I like to sow chaos in my opponent's minds, right? I, I, I don't play the traditional moves. And the, the untraditional move at that point would have been, okay, we have, we can call 300,000 reservists, put them in the Gaza border, go after strategic Hamas targets where we're minimizing as much as possible the civilian damage, depriving them from all the pictures of children and, you know, women and homes demolished and all of that, but still inflicting some damage. And even I would be for a campaign to go after their leadership abroad. But I would, what I would have done, I would have sent a message to the Saudis. Here is Bibi Netanyahu. Here is my price. You call in an immediate summit and you recognize the state of Israel unconditionally 
You we have a peace treaty together. You bring in the UAE, which has already the Abrahamic Accords, but we go in for a full fledged peace accord with Israel, where all the Arab nations, the Arab League meets, and they recognize the state of Israel right now. This is my price. Otherwise, you know, I'm going for option B. And that would have taken the, the, the would have taken the initiative from Hamas because in chess terms, now no, you know, Hamas has had the one pawn or had the rook. They had your rook, but we're you know the Israelis are catching up still. You know we the Israelis do not have a victory yet. I mean, eventually we know Israel will win this just by the sheer force of the Israeli military. But I wish that that would have been the response. At On October 8th, that would have been the response. Now, I understand why Bibi Netanyahu had to do what he did and why he's doing what he did. And I'd say Israel has the right to defend itself. Because of the anxiety we know that the Jewish people and Israel has, that is the logical move. This is, you know, that you're playing Indian defense in a chess game, and these are the moves, right? You're moving your rook to a3, you know, we know how this will work. But there is room for some creative thinking. And I would say there is still room for that, even though the Israeli, you know, penetration to Gaza has started. I wish to see the Israeli government or the American government thinking in those terms, saying, okay, guys, here is the price that Israel wants. First, and again, I can't stress that enough to anyone who wants to talk about the subject on my in my tribe. Release the hostages unharmed unconditionally now. Right? That's number one. And number two. Netanyahu should say to the Arab leaders, get your act together again to Cairo or whatever hole you meet in and say, we recognize the state of Israel and deprive Hamas and Iran from, you know, the, the PR victory they are having on the Arab mind. Because that's my biggest concern is that the Arab mind is being further polluted by what's happening in Gaza. You know, there are the radicalization, and again, I'm not saying this from an Islamophobe perspective, the Islamic mindset needs to change. Then that's a topic probably for another podcast. But right now what's happening with the usual dynamics is the Islamic mind, the Arab mind, the Eastern Christian mind even, is being polluted by, by all the scenes of carnage they are receiving from Gaza. And that's that's my biggest concern because my concern is the future. I'm I'm not the past has passed. I can't dwell on it, or I'd go Michigan as you'd say, you know, in Yiddish, right? Uh, I need to think of the future, and I need to think of those children and kids and the the future generation, both Israeli and Arab, both Israeli and Arab, because I really. I really care about the Israeli generations too. This will be the neighbors of my nephews, the you know their friends, hopefully the people they go to college with, the people they will learn from. Um, and to be honest, I'm selfishly invested in this in the sense that I want to go back to Israel, Palestine, whatever it is. I want to walk into a Chabad shiur and listen to Torah and. You know, study Torah with them. I I want to go into Breslev uh, Shur and study there with them. I I love doing that. Uh, you know, I I want to talk to Israeli students. Uh, I want I want that. I want this future that Hamas radical Islam is standing in the way of right now. So that's why we, it's even more urgent to think in non-conventional terms, like uh, play play the game in a chaotic manner that confuses Hamas's and Iran's strategy book. You know, something that they did not expect. You know, anyway. That's fascinating. Well, the very interesting um, perspective. And you know, like you said, Nehemia, Jabra's voice is a very important voice and needs to be heard in a unique perspective. Uh, why don't you uh, chime in? 
Yeah, so I think the Israeli perspective is that if we don't go in and um, deal a crippling blow to Hamas, um, then this is going to happen every year. Yeah, yeah Hezbollah I understand. will see, okay, well, we can get away with this. And yes. look, I think what's happening in, in Gaza is absolutely tragic. Something mm -hmm. like fifty percent of the of the of the houses have been destroyed. Yes, thousands of people have died. Yes, um, that was Hamas's intention, and they're using them as human shields. They're preventing people from fleeing. I mean, is, the the people on October seventh weren't given a twenty four hour warning. Israel gave a twenty four hour warning, and then actually gave a week or more, yeah. maybe two weeks. And, so yeah, and that blood is on Hamas's hand. I want to say this: hundred percent that they could see that happening. It's hard to see October 7th and mm -hmm. October 8th without putting an estimate on the casualties and what would happen to Gaza. Right? They knew exactly what would happen. There's a famous quote from Golda Meir I'm going to read. She said, when peace comes, we will perhaps in time be able to forgive the Arabs for killing our sons. Yes. But it will be harder for us to forgive them for having forced us to kill their sons. Yes. Peace will come yes. when the Arabs will love their children more than they hate us. Well, that's not today, not in Gaza. But yeah. I appreciate, Jabra, that you're expressing um, empathy for, for Jews who have suffered. And, you know, I, I don't know anybody in, on the Israeli side who's happy about the death of, death of civilians in Gaza. Well, it's no. tragic. It's absolutely tragic. But it's a tragedy caused by Hamas. Mm -hmm. And intentionally, very deliberately and very cynically. Very cynically, and, and I think Arabs, mm. and I know anyone who watches this will say, turncoat, traitor, let them say it. Uh, um, we need to take radical responsibility, radical responsibility for the lives of those people. And we need to know where to lay the blame. We need to know where to lay the blame. And the blame is on Hamas, on Iran, on Hezbollah, on all of those people who have these rigid ancient mindsets that are not who are not open to anything but their vision of a you know future you know whatever state they want that's dominated by their version mm -hmm. of islam and to be honest as a as an arab christian i want to tell you this now i want to have it out there the 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 most concerning part to me of palestinian Arab rhetoric about the whole Palestine-Israel conflict or Israel-Palestine conflict is this. In the last two decades, it has totally become like added to these Islamic causes, and they totally wiped out from the picture any Palestinian Christians. And the Palestinian Christians have to insert themselves into this and say, hey, you're deciding things for us. You're, you're shelling rockets in Israel. You're not consulting with anyone. But the Palestinian Christians have been taken out of that whole situation. And it's even more disconcerting to me when I look at on TV and I see flags, you know, these Palestinian flags in New York, and they have, you know, the ISIS logo on it or the Saudi logo or the even, even saying Allahu Akbar or whatever. Because to me, that that says okay this is an islamic conflict you christian you you stay out of it but you are a convenient prop when a church falls in gaza because hamas was camping next door and deliberately you know like what happened with that hospital and they were firing from it and one of their rockets misfired they still refused to take responsibility for it and this is one reason I'm doing this is because someone needs to go out there and, and and I'm not saying, you know, it's me, but I'm saying there needs to be examples of taking radical responsibility and saying this is the, there are children dying, but those children are in the care of Hamas. And it's Hamas did this knowing exactly what's going to happen to them. And this quote that you just mentioned about the tunnels not being for the protection of the people of Gaza. That, that, is, that goes you know, right into what, what I've always believed about those systems is that they are invested in protecting themselves, not the people. The people are props and tools and nobody else matters. Because in the end, this is about them, their power, their wealth, their bank accounts, whatever it is. 
uh, that they are sitting there accumulating. You know, Khalid Mishal sits in sits in Qatar in a in a comfortable room, and he makes these denouncements. And Ismail Haniyeh calls these families in Gaza, and I'm like, well, go there if you think this is important. Go there and face. Your, the consequences of your action yourself. Don't do the media prop, you know, Al Jazeera video showing that you care because you, you're not invested in this. How many kids did Khalid Mish'al lose in this fight? How many kids did Ismail Ani lose in this fight? Zero, zero, not that I know of. And the rest of the Palestinian children are traumatized and dying, right? So yeah. anyway, that's what Rad- sense about. And I think the term used radical responsibility is a really... Um important uh, uh, way of, of describing that. Uh, J- uh, Nehemia, I, uh, I know you actually are doing a fundraiser with your group as well. Um, if you have a chance, why don't you pull it up on your computer screen? Yeah, um, you share screen. Website, uh, my website, nehemiaswell.com. Let me share a uh, share the screen here. Um, here's a, a episode we just put out called, uh, uh, my program's called Hebrew Voices. It's why I can't, what I can't control. And we were talking here about some of the talk about anxiety that Israelis are going through. And there's things I can't control. I mean, th- this, you know, in the U.S., it's things like, well, I can't control, you know, the noisy neighbor and, you know, and and, you know, and people being disrespectful. And here it's like the status of the kidnapped and um, the number of murdered and things like that. And so here we have a, a fundraiser um where we've raised at this point something like i don't remember exactly like seventy thousand dollars just to help the survivors my wife was when we were over there my wife went to help the survivors my um sisters are in the field of optometry and some of these people ran out of their homes that day without their glasses i mean literally like they, they couldn't leave uh, they had to leave immediately they couldn't stop to get anything and so they left sometimes in their pajamas without shoes um the survivors i'm talking about and so we decided we're going to do we're leaving because we you know our situation makes it that we that's the best thing for us but um we're going to do what we can to help the survivors because this is like i said it's kishinev um and we need to help the people who survived but i I know we probably need to end soon can we um and i'm not a you know i i wish jason was here can we end with with a short reading from the book of mormon can we do that um, yeah. Would that be okay, Jabra. I have a passage I'd like to read. You mentioned in your previous interview, Jabra, and I really recommend people go watch that over on Mormon Book Reviews. Um, you talked about the example of the anti uh, Nephi Lehi's, mm-hmm. who are these pacifists who went out to battle and over a thousand of them were killed. And look, I'm, I'm a text person. It's what I do. I, I read texts. That's my profession. Me too. So, so I want. I'm not a Mormon, but I'd like to read from the Book of Mormon if, if that, that's okay with you. Um, that's absolutely there's, fine. There's a story of um, uh, it's in Third uh, Nephi chapter three about uh-huh. the. You mentioned also Hamas as the Gadianton robbers. Who, yes. Um, guys, Google that if you don't know who it is. If you're not from the Mormon background or the LDS background, uh, so interesting um, figures, the Gadianton robbers. They're sort of like these bandits who had the secret society. So there it's a story of this man named Gaddy Anhai, who's the head of the Gaddy Anton robbers. I hope I'm pronouncing these words correctly. It's okay. And, and he writes a letter to the head of the Nephites, the Nephites, who are the um, the good guys in the Book of Mormon. You, you could actually be racially um, from the um, the name. other group, but if you followed like the right beliefs, then you, you were considered a Nephite, if I understand it correctly. Um so uh like you could be racially a lamanite but if you were uh, of the belief of the um nephites mm-hmm. and you were a nephite right. and vice versa mm-hmm. um oh we lost jabra oh no oh, jabra well um, that's okay he'll, he'll okay. be back on so he so, writes this letter um to Lacon- he says laconius most this is chapter uh 3 verse 2 of third nephi laconius most noble and chief governor of the land behold i write you this epistle unto you and do give unto you exceedingly great praise because of your firmness and also the firmness of your people in maintaining that which ye suppose to be your right and liberty, right? So already this is like a tone of Hamas. You think you've got this country, Israel. You, you, it's not even such a country, right? Yeah. Which you, you suppose to be your right and liberty. Yea, you do uh, stand well as if you were supported by the hand of a god, right? I mean, this really sounds like Hamas. You believe in this, you know, well, I guess they do recognize the God of Israel. They just don't think we have any relationship with him. In the uh, the hand of a God in the defense of your liberty and your property and your country, or that which you do call so, 
right? So you have this pretend country, Israel. Um, and it seemeth the pity unto me, most noble Laconius. Again, this is the bad guys right into the good guys. That you should be so foolish and vain as to suppose that you can stand against so many brave men who are at my command, right? In other words, we're going to come and slaughter you all mm -hmm. uh, if you don't surrender immediately. In verse 6, he says, Therefore I write unto you, desiring that you would yield up unto this my people your cities, your land, and your possessions, rather than that you should visit, uh, that they should visit you with the sword, and that destruction should come upon you. Um, and verse 7 is really interesting, because here the Gadianton robbers are fundamentally different than Hamas. So Gadianhai says to Laconius, Or in other words, yield yourselves up unto us and unite with us, and become acquainted with our secret works, and become our brethren, that ye may be like unto us, not our slaves, but our brethren and partners of all our substance. So this is there's there's two models in Jewish history. There's there's the model of 1492 Spain uh -huh. and 1497 Portugal. In 1492, the um the Spanish said to the Jews, which was, I mean, Ashkenazi Jews were a backwater. The main Jewish community in 1492 was was the was the uh, Sephardic Jews. Right, it was the yeah. center of Jewish intellectual life. Um, rabbis used to come from Germany and France to learn how do we write a Torah scroll, because you guys in Spain you know what to do. We're you know we're just kind of on the fringe. Um, so in 1492, they said convert or die. Or sorry, excuse me. They, sorry, in 1492 the Spanish said convert or leave Spain. Right, convert or surrender. Right, those are your choices, basically. So those are the Gadianha. That's Gadianha. That's the Gadianton robbers. Hamas is like Portugal in 1497. The choice wasn't convert or leave. It was convert or die. Yeah. And yeah. Um, here, I guess this is actually Portugal. I said it wrong. Right. There wasn't an option to leave to um, to to Laconius and and the Nephites. It was you join us or we're going to kill you all. Yes. Um, so Hamas is actually worse than Spain or Portugal, now that I think about it, right? There's yeah. not even an option to convert. Just die. Yeah. That, yeah. That's the When they say from the river to the sea, Palestine be free, they mean the 7 million Jews between the river and the sea should be dead. Yeah. And, and I, I tell you this, that again, and I hope... I, I always say this, people will hear this and they'll say, oh, traitor, turncoat, all of that stuff. But let me say this. There is, and I don't approach this from an Islamophobe perspective, okay? But as an Arab Christian who lived in Muslim countries, and I lived in several of them, you are always a second, third, even fourth class citizen in those communities. You don't have access to opportunities. You're not equal before the law. There are laws that are specific to you. And this is the kind of vision that even I'm afraid, I'm sad to say that even the most moderate of Arabs would grant is that we take over this place and, you know, the constitution becomes uh, based on the Quran and you know, Jews, Christians, all of that are second class citizens. And unfortunately, you know, the Christian Arab population and many people, even in the West Bank, I have a, a huge family there, uncles, aunts, cousins. They would tell you since the Palestinian Authority came, since the, you know, it has degraded to where it's very Islamic, Christians are excluded, all of that stuff. And so, no, that's that's the vision they have. And it's unfortunately for for Jews, we know how Arab governments treated Jews, how they treated them in Iraq, how they treated them in Syria, how they treated them in Egypt, how they treated them in Libya and Yemen. We know that and we know that's the model they have in mind. So I see no reason why uh, an Israeli or a Jew would see any future in a place ruled by an Arab majority. It's very uh -huh. sad for me to say, but it, again, this is radical responsibility and radical truth telling. And I think that they need, and um, I welcome anyone to challenge me on that view. I welcome anyone to challenge me on that view, because even if they do in the depths of their heart, they would know that they'd be lying. You know, if no no Arab is willing to take from their constitutions. The Quran is the basis of this constitution. And to be honest, as a Christian, I reject that. I don't want that. Luckily, I live in the U.S. I'm an American citizen. I don't have to worry about it. But 
that is the fact. That is the fact. Yeah. With all that said, you know, Israel is a, is a democracy that has over a million uh, citizens who are Muslims and they have full rights before the law mm -hmm. and they can work in any job they want. Many of them serve in the Israeli army to defend the country, not all of them, but many of them. And even the ones who don't, though, have full rights before the law. And um, I think in that respect, Israel is uh, more similar to the Nephite nation because you could be ethnically a, a, a Lamanite, but if you signed up for the values of, of the Nephite nation, you were considered a Nephite. Yeah. And um, I think that's that's a beautiful thing. Um, I think I think that, you know, we, there's this concept today called civil nationalism, which is. It's not about what you know. Jews invented this, basically, right? Yeah. You know, you, you talked about how there were Jews who were integrated into Germany and integrated into these other countries. Um, Jews, what they did is said, "Look, I, I don't have the German ethnicity, but I can write a beautiful poem. I can write a beautiful book, a beautiful opera, and make that part of German culture, and I can belong to that." Exactly. And and, and I can belong to the state, and I can be loyal to the state. I mean. In Judaism, we have this principle, Dina de Machuta Dina, the law of the yeah. land is the law, which means yeah. that as an American citizen, I need to be loyal. My religion tells me I have to be loyal to um, the United States. And if you're a French Jew, you have to be loyal to France. It's part of your religion. And it's certainly part of our culture. Yeah, so, yeah. And, and the Israelis, the, the Jews, you know, in Israel, they've done that beautifully. We've seen that. And the Jews did it beautifully in Germany. You know, in my studies... That was what stood out is how amazingly integrated Jews were in every European population, and unfortunately, and that's to me that's always been the 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 greatest mystery. You know what Churchill said: an enigma folded in a mystery, folded in something else. You know, I forgot the exact saying, but yeah. the the fact that and many of them bled and died in first world war for germany and they were loyal tsarists they 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 were braver than hitler himself and still the nazis managed to turn the minds of the german population and in most of europe i mean we talk about ukraine we have the ukrainian collaboration there's the serbian collaboration which unfortunately i mean Hussein was a part of i mean you you talk about all of these things and you're thinking wow I mean, Salonika in, in Greece, those people were as Greek as Greek can be. And still, the populations turned on them in Adam. And to me, that is the, the, the greatest mystery in the world. You know, well, I've said, I've said before happen? that anti-Semitism is satanic. It's ugly, satanic. It's ugly. It's, it needs to be eradicated. I don't know how to eradicate right. it other than by practicing radical truth, radical responsibility, confronting it and saying things even when it's not comfortable for people to listen to. And I think what we also modeled here was we had a Karaite Jew read from the Book of Mormon today. And, and I think that was the most beautiful. Now, Maya, I want to study the Book of Mormon with you, man. I would love Let's to do, do that. it. Let's do it. I love it. Hey, AJ, what do you what do you think? You want to join in on the study? Wouldn't that be interesting? <laughs> I'm, work, I'm working my way through the Quran now, actually. It's a very beautiful <laughs> book. Uh, I have it actually right behind me. Um, you know, what Jabra mentioned, there's the way that people even weaponize certain, you know, religious texts in a way that when you, you know, when you actually engage with the text, um, there's a lot of different ways to read everything, right? So what are your intentions when you look at a book? You know, yeah, exactly. do you look at the very fundamental violent parts and say, oh, this is the most important. This is relevant for nowadays. Um, or do you look at the parts which I think the overarching theme in a lot of in the Abrahamic religions, at least, is, is really loving other humans, making the world a beautiful place, um, being kind to people, being kind to those that are downtrodden. Um, so do you focus on that? Like, what are your intentions? Like, where do you want to go with that? Because you could read any of these books and we know, and um, there's very violent Jewish people and violent Christians of all different sects and, and violent Muslims of all different sects, but there's very peaceful people from all those religious, you know, backgrounds. So like, what are you going to do with that? And that's, I think, very important um, uh, to, to something for me that I find very important is sometimes also engage in those texts yourself, like the Book of Mormon. I was actually looking up some quotes uh, 
prior uh, to this as well. You know, look at the Quran. Take look at something else, which isn't necessarily something that you revere um, in your personal day to day, but other people do. Um, and you'll see that so many of the common themes of of being kind and and being nice to your neighbor and stuff that 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 are really kind of the, the thread of every you know kind of what I find the the main thread of 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 all of these texts uh, and so yeah it's uh that's great thanks yeah, AJ. I mean, I mean one one more thing Steve and I <laughs> I'm so sorry about this but I have to say it. Uh, my morning, so my morning, and this has been the case for the last five years, always starts. So I listen to scriptures or read scriptures, but then for about two hours, I study Torah and I study it from, I have these files that I collect and I study the Dvar Torahs from everywhere, from Breslev, Chabad, Reconstruction, Progressive, you know, reform Judaism. And I have to tell you, I just love it. And I even study from a rabbi whose name is Gordon, Nehemia, Rabbi, rabbi Gordon. He's a Chabad rabbi. He was in the Chabad of the Valley in California. And I love listening to his shores. You know, may his memory be a blessing. He's dead. But he, I feel like he's my friend. And I can't have a day without listening to his Dvar Torahs and his lessons. So there, there is beauty when we study those texts without prejudice and we see the good in them and try to put them in a better context anyway. Amen. Well, gentlemen, I just want to thank all of you. And of course, we're going to have links for AJ's uh, fundraiser we talked about at the beginning, as well as for uh, Nehemiah's uh, project that they're doing as well to help the Jewish people and the survivors. Um, by the way, AJ, just real quick, how is Rabbi uh, Lerner doing? So they've been, you know, I just get updates from there. They, he seems to be doing fine. They're every day uh, mobilized, uh, delivering packages to displaced people. Um, all those, all those sort of thing. Aid is coming in. They have, you know, a giant warehouse, and they're distributing it to, you know, to everybody, to everybody there. Uh, so uh, he's doing good. Um, all my other friends that are in the military as of now are fine. Checked in. I try, try to check in with them every day. Um, my friend who actually called during the podcast, I was supposed to have a call with him prior, but he's like, I'm in the bomb shelter. I can't call. And then he called me now. So, you know, there, there's always that stress and worry that I think everybody in the region is kind of going through of, of what anything can happen, you know? Um, and for me, at least I, try to, you know, pray for everybody's peace and really peace in the region and around the world. Amen. Well, yeah. uh, thank you all for coming on. Thank you, Jason, my homie, uh, for coming on. Sorry you had to bail uh, early, but that uh, happens. Uh, we got through some of our technical difficulties with Jabra there, but everything went without a hitch. Was This was, a, uh, I think, a really beautiful, important conversation we had today. And I'm really proud of what this channel has been able to do to have I think very unique conversations that aren't have been being had anywhere else. And this is to me is, is how it works. This is interfaith in action. And don't forget to also subscribe to my Utah interfaith YouTube channel. I have a link in the description there. I also have links in the description to everything we talked about today. Um, I want to thank all of you again for coming on. I just remember the most important thing is this folks is remember all the voices of the restoration will be heard here on Mormon book reviews.